Hello, Jess. Hello, Charlotte. It is so nice to be here with you. Such an honour to be just sitting here and about to have this conversation about a book which is literally hot off the press, your MacBook, Look At Me. Congratulations. Now, rumour has it that you literally have an advanced copy in your hands. Is this true? Thank you. It is true. And before I show you the copy, though, I have to say how much of an honour it is for me to have this conversation with you. And I so appreciate you being here. I've wanted to do something like this with you for years, and I finally had this chance. So I'm so grateful and can't <laughs> wait to have this conversation. I'm so excited. I have no idea how we're going to keep it to an hour, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> and I do indeed have a hot off the press advanced copy here. It arrived yesterday Ooh. after a bit of a, a shipping saga, but it is here <laughs> and can give you a, a, a little close look here. There's Ooh. my name. And then going right into the, the photographs. <gasps> Will you just take say yeah. again? No, you say. <laughs> I was gonna say I won't explain too much yet because I know we're about to have a meaty conversation. But uh, I can I can refer back to the actual book if it feels helpful or, or necessary, but just to give folks a sense of, of how it exists on the page. It's so tantalizing you doing turning the pages. I should also say that you've also pinned up on your back wall of your studio um, the layout, the sequencing of the text and the photographs, which is maybe a kind of a good place to start. Now, I've, I've seen the PDF. I'm really excited to see the book, which will be on these shores soon. Um, but there were loads of things that struck me about the book that sort of is, is really a sort of introduction and a description to what this book is. I mean, obviously, I've known you for a while, and I know that this is not a kind of full kind of summary, end of project book. It's, for me, it felt very much like a very pungent and remarkable account of a, a position or a stage within this ongoing uh, body of work, a set of, a body of personal work that you've been creating all the time that I've known you. And I mean, the obvious kind of like striking part of the book um, for me is the, in, the very strong, and, and we're going to discuss this a lot, relationship between your writing and the photographs, which really creates this kind of structure and this kind of ebb and flow and emotional journey of the book. But I think um, seeing your book, um, just glimpsing it, tantalizing on Zoom, tantalizingly on Zoom, um, is also the subtlety of the book, which sort of comes across in like the tiny foil of your name and uh, and of the title of the book, and this kind of elegance of the work, but really this subtlety that there's, if looking through the PDF and looking at how you were sort of building and the arc of the emotional arc and the narrative arc of the book, it felt super subtle in terms of there was lots of space for me as the as the reader to come and enter into this story and also I think this kind of you know just human maturation of you know the ambiguity of situations and the readings of situations so it felt very reflective as a book and um, so I guess really uh, sort of my first question to you is, is really about what this book, what Look At Me represents to you in your own context, like what you were aiming for or what now you've got, ah, it's a book, it's a physical book, it's finally <laughs> arrived, what it feels like to you as a, as a narrative and emotional arc. Sure. Yeah. I had so many thoughts while you were speaking and I'll try to keep them all in order here. Okay. But I love, I love that you picked up on the subtlety of the book because that is something that I was really interested in. I was interested in leaving a lot of ambiguity for the viewer. We can talk about that in more depth. Um, and something that Mac was interested in too, really having a kind of understated right. emotional experience. So I think you're right too, when you say that this book came out of a very specific moment. And for me, I view this as one of my most personal works I've ever made. I view it as incredibly self-reflective. It's very much about 
me in this moment in my life, both as a person and as an artist. I'm mm. thinking about my own process of aging. You know, I've always been interested in identity and some of my earlier work was more pointed around, you know, gender identity or sexual orientation. And I feel like with this work, I just went full on identity in terms of personhood and in terms of thinking about defining a self and understanding a self in relation to others, which is really a core interest of mine and a core theme of mine, thinking about how our identities are validated through relationship. So that's the moment this work came out of for me. You know, most of the photographs are from the past few years. There are a few earlier ones, primarily of my partner, Vanessa, from 2014 or 2015. But the majority of these photographs are from the past two or three years. And yes. all of the writing was done between March and September of 2021. So the book also came out of a very specific moment. And of course, it was mid pandemic. And the pandemic had a huge influence on my work, both on my photographs, uh, practically, but but more so psychologically. And I did all of the writing during that period of time. And I was really reflecting on my own identity, thinking about how I'm aging, thinking about being a parent. I became a parent a few years ago. And there are a few small references to that in the book, um, although it's not an overarching theme, but, but it definitely has affected how I think of my own personhood and my own identity. Um, yeah. And then of course, reflecting on connection and isolation. And so this book really feels to me that it is of this moment. It is part of a much larger body of work, but I decided to really harness this energy of this moment and, yeah. um, and put it into this form, which I very much think of as a visual poem. I think of it as a, a kind of experience between covers. And we could talk about, there are some, you know, technical and conceptual things we did with the book to make it feel that way. Um, but I really wanted to go super personal, super subjective, I intentionally left a lot of room for the viewer, which I would love to double down on and, um, and, and went full throttle on it being about me and my own desires and the way that those desires intersect with others and other people's identities and their own desires. I mean, one of the, the I'm going to bring up and, and refer to my notes as we talk, and particularly there were certain phrases or sentences that appear in your writing that have both that were very revelatory to me. And I understand that you know one of the successes of the books is this is that generosity of space that you give the reader. So this is my personal reading always but um let's use that because i am your one of your first readers and there's a there's a phrase that comes up which really began to sort of help me understand that you were in a particular phase of life and this was a new vantage point onto your practice and it's the phrase i learned to name myself through desire to understand what it felt like to be seen and I think for me, you brought up, you know, the parenthood and personhood as these two kind of points of reflection amongst others that you've been making to do this book and to do this writing. But I thought that was an incredibly generous thing for you to say to a reader who's presumably not had the same experience of gender nonconformity and the battles and the journey that you have had to sort of mark this moment as one which is less determined by kind of desire and objects of desire and people and it's more about the relationality and a, a kind of longer more maturing journey of gender non-conforming but also a sense of personhood. You know when I wrote that phrase I was thinking about my own experience coming of age as a younger person mm -hmm. and thinking about specific relationships that allowed me to come to understand myself and to see myself through the eyes of another person and thinking of that specifically as something that happened outside of a status quo or outside of a, a normative expectation and thinking of the power of that. But I also yeah. think about desire more broadly and I'm really interested in the multiple kinds of desire. And I think for me, this book is just like dripping with desire. <laughs> It is, you know, some of it is a desire to be close to someone that I'm photographing. You know, everyone that's in this book is someone who I felt some magnetic pull 
towards or some interest in. So there's some kind of chemistry there. So there's desire just purely to be close. There's desire to look. There's a desire to see how that person looks at me, to see how we intersect. There's a desire for me to sometimes be like the person that I'm photographing. So there's this really complicated play of desire where it's, you know, there are certainly references to, um, you know, romantic desire or sexual desire in the book. But I also think of desire much more broadly. And for me, it's a really key part of my work and, and part of my practice. Mm. And would you describe that as like a photographic desire? Like that, that there's something about your relationship with photography as well that you'd wrap up with the word desire? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think that I have always used photography to make sense of my life and make sense of my place in the world. And so it is this constant. Um, and there are references in the book to photography as an anchor uh, or photography as this through line. And yeah. yes, I would absolutely say there is a kind of photographic desire, um, but it's also the medium through which I make sense of everything, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I know we're gonna talk about the text too, but the texts have in my mind, three main categories. There's one that is a telling of a particular story or a, uh, a particular memory that comes from a photograph. And then there's another category that are reflections on why I photographed, why I feel compelled to photograph, why it's so urgent for me, why it's so essential, how I how it intersects with my life and my relationships. And then there's a third category that's more specifically about desire. So there's some shorter texts that really just hone in on desire. And mm. I didn't set out to make these categories. I just noticed when the writing was done that there were these kind of three tones that the writing takes and it ebbs and flows throughout the book and you know you encounter different ones at different times. I mean the timing and the sort of sequencing of those texts and images is really extraordinary and I don't think it's at the beginning of the book but there was a certain point maybe midway where in the text you describe this moment with somebody an encounter and you describe how the grass is browning and they kind of they kind of intertwine their fingers on the back of their neck and then maybe a few pages later there's that photograph mm -hmm. or at least there's a photograph that now is like an equivalency to that text i don't know if it's the same moment whether the text is referring to the moment in that photograph or not but th that that that's something that repeats through the sequencing of the book and um yeah, I think I'd really love to know more about like at what point it sort of becomes like a strategy that you're willing to kind of reveal or articulate about how you're sequencing the relationship between text and images in the book. Sure. So the texts often for me came from a specific photograph. I often was writing right. about a specific photograph or a specific memory. Sometimes I would write a text and then create a photograph that reminded me of the text. But in most of the cases, the texts have a very direct link. But we decided when sequencing the book to be very intentionally ambiguous and separate the source of the text from the text. There are one or two exceptions where my original text is linked with the image I wrote it about. Um, and I was really interested in, well, first, leaving a lot of room for the viewer, leaving a lot of ambiguity. I was interested also in leaving some ambiguity about the kinds of relationships I might have with different people in the book. I didn't want yes. that to be too literal. Um, and I also was interested in this idea of memory, even as you go through the book. I was interested in someone, for example, reading a text and then five or 10 pages later coming upon an image, like you mentioned, that sort of jogs that text. And I was also interested in the reverse. So, there was a very intentional, you know, the editing and sequencing was very intentional and it was done to leave this openness and ambiguity. And actually, even though I really wanted that, it was almost impossible for me to separate the texts from the images. So yeah. there was a, a pretty big influence from Mac's side to help me do that because I am so, you know, I'm so connected to all of my work, but this project in particular is just so personal. And because there's my own words and my own writing, it was nearly impossible for me to separate them. And so I needed a bit of outside influence on that. But um, 
but intellectually, I was always interested in that ambiguity and, and leaving, leaving room for different kinds of interpretations. I, that is, thank you. For, thank you for explaining that, because that's sort of like it's like, ah, that's like a good aha moment, because on the one hand, I was sort of battling with that, because on the one hand, the affect is this idea of ambiguity, which I think it sort of is very layered, as, as you're saying, which is it's it's about not being over prescriptive in terms of what the relationship is in truth between you and the subjects. I think it's also the ambiguity of what something means at the point at which that memory is 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 originally made versus what it becomes in the context of other memories. And um, something that I learned a few years ago was it was at the time in the mid 2010s, it was new research, neurological research. But now I think it's sort of being accepted as a cultural phenomenon that neurologically, when you when you create a new memory, when you when you then have a new memory it has this sort of knock-on effect in the positioning of all other memories so in a way when you recall a memory it becomes a new memory so it's like this constantly kind of shifting kind of narrative kind of web of memories and the meaning of a memory shifts and i felt you know you know that's a very very broad um kind of uh a sort of affect that I think lots of experiences within a pandemic and sort of the recall, remembering who you are, forgetting things, you know, all of the sort of brain fog or the kind of recalibrations that we've been going through neurologically. There was something of a resonance and a, a sort of mm. deep understanding and sort of like empathy to the way that our, we think of our own memories at this particular moment that seemed very resonant in the book. However, that all said, I don't think that clearly that wasn't unintentional on your part. So there was also my worry was like, actually, that this was highly manipulative on your part, that you were then <laughs> <laughs> you were then messing with us or kind of like over directing us. So it's actually really nice to know that they're kind of at some point you had to sort of give that over and sort of give permission to others within the Mac team to really kind of uh, uh, bring the text and the images together to do the work and to have the effect that you wanted to reach and that was a lot to ask of yourself i think particularly with somebody who's always been incredibly responsible to how you to your subjects and how they are kind of how text accompanies images and the kind of context within which your subjects are represented so this does feel like it, it needed to be both strategic but quite rightly others needed to be involved in that process to see to look at you as it were within the process one of the one of the other things about the word ambiguity which is like we've added subtlety and ambiguities together as two of the characteristics for the um, project is I wondered if you had a, a view on the idea of ambiguity as being a sort of not only a state of mind but also a state of personhood one that I think um within non-binary people and non-binary communities is much more of a kind of understood and sort of flexed understanding of person of personhood really that the idea that ambiguity is about it's this but it is also this that there's always this sort of opportunity for for things being unfixed in fact there's a necessity in understanding it from an unfixed position right I have so many thoughts about those questions too. I think for your first topic and question about memory, mm. you know, I mentioned that I wrote all of these texts in basically a six month period. And I think it was really important to me that they all essentially came from the same moment or a similar moment, because I am often looking back on things, but I suspect that my writing in five years will be very different. So right. I was interested in, in kind of, how I make sense of my life and how I make sense of my past in this moment, knowing that that will change. Um, so I was really interested in harnessing that, especially mid pandemic when I, like so many of us was on a kind of heightened self-reflection and asking existential questions about how I wanna live and who I wanna be in relationship with and what I want those relationships to mean and what is fulfilling and what is meaningful and what is important. At least for me, that's where I went during a lot of that time. And I, I know that others did as well. 
Um, thinking about ambiguity in terms of gender, I think for me, I might use the word multiplicity, uh, having, you know, not so much ambiguity, but having multiple things true or present simultaneously. And I'm really interested in that. Um, you know, some of my, my earlier work was more definitive in terms of the identities of the subjects. And I'm really, I'm not interested in that in this work in quite the same way. Um, yeah. And it may be hard to tease out in language, but, you know, certainly in this book and, and in this work, there are themes of gender and there are themes of sexuality and there are themes of queerness and there are themes of gender nonconformity and there are images of my body and there are images of queer couples. So all of that's in there but it's kind of wrapped up in these larger questions. Yeah. I mean, we keep using the word personhood, but about personhood and about desire and about coming to know yourself deeply and you know, relating to people from that place and having that relationship be meaningful and be validating and be you know, empowering or uh, yeah. you know, yeah, really kind of reflect the fullness of who you are. So I think I'm thinking about the multiple truths that are inside of each person and multiple identities that are inside of each person. Um, and another thing that I just thought of when you were asking that question is themes is, is about themes of loss or themes of fear of loss. And I think that comes through in this book perhaps more than in some of my, my other work. Um, but there are some texts that talk about kind of trying to hold on to things or an awareness that things could end or an awareness that things could change. And I think for me, that is embedded into these photographs. And that also translates into a kind of urgency to live authentically and in a way that's meaningful because I've just always had, and, and you could you could definitely psychoanalyze my, my life and upbringing, but I've always just had an awareness that things could, could end or change. And I think that's somehow embedded into this work. There's like an urgency of living, an awareness yeah. of struggle past, an awareness of potential loss, but also a, a deep pursuit of beauty and meaning and relationship and a commitment to pursuing these things, you know, simultaneously understanding the risk of loss. And that's kind of where this work hinges, I think. Yes, and but also it's like the story is not over. This is not the end of the story, which I think um, is another way in which like the sort of the indefinite of of our lives is, and not to psychoanalyze you, I think that that kind of need to, to be present in the now and to, deal with the context but also be open to the fact that you know it's, it it's it was not like this before and it will not like be like this again and i wondered um it just occurred to me in terms i mean it's a maybe it's a minor point but there are some incredibly beautiful still lives of arrangements of flowers in this book i mean agonizingly beautiful so i obviously <laughs> put them in the sort of like desire but i wondered if this was also yeah. part of the loss as well the sort of memento mori within the book yeah absolutely i i have made still lifes before obviously i primarily photograph people but during the pandemic i returned more intensely to still lives and that's when the flowers really came in and I think for me they were a way for me to reflect on this moment to think about loss to think about the potential of death to think about the urgency of life I mean I know so many photographers photograph flowers I it's funny I'm like at, throwing my hat into that ring I'm adding myself <laughs> um I think you're ready <laughs> I photograph flowers now. Um, but, it, but it was a way for me, you know, I was really trying to get at something deeply emotional and psychological. And I was trying to process this moment. And, um, and also, you know, I have begun increasingly to, um, what am I trying to say? With the newer work, the sequencing has become really important. And I think of it as a kind of, you know, lyrical path. And, and that's both in the book for sure, but even in an exhibition space. And so I think for me, the flowers also came in as a way to hit a different emotional tenor and, and think of it more in sequence. And that felt really important because I was still making portraits. I was making, I, I was working all throughout the pandemic, 
Um, and the way that I worked changed, but I was consistently making portraits, but I was just trying to get at something like more internal and deeper. And so the flowers do that for me. There are a few, you know, environmental images or other yeah. kinds of life images in the book. And I think those end up playing a really important psychological role in the pacing. Um, yes. And then of course the flowers, you know, perhaps most obviously they're a reference to life and death, but I also thought of them as a kind of stand-in for portraits in a way. You know, there's one of tulips where they're bending over. Yes. That one in particular, I just, I felt like I was making a portrait the whole time that I was making that image because I felt like they were expressing their own gesture to me. And they, of course, you know, there are two of them and it looks like they're embracing. And I very much thought of that as a stand-in for two people or a stand-in for a kind of relationship. So I yes. always conceptualized the still life images in very direct dialogue with the portraits. Yes. And in the book in particular, we really pulled that sequencing forward. There are, there are several pairings throughout the book where there's a kind of intense portrait and a quiet still life and they're linked often by color um, or a kind of gesture. And that was, that was definitely done very intentionally. And one other thing I wanted to add in terms of sequencing is um, you know, you see these little prints behind me. This was how I sequenced the book, but I took all of my photographs and then I took each piece of writing and moved them around as their own building blocks. So I had, you know, 20 some odd pieces of writing and 60 photographs and really I figured, out, figured out a sequence of them that felt poetic. So it wasn't, the writing wasn't linear and, and the photographing wasn't linear either. It was a very, um, it was a poetic, emotional, gestural formal way of sequencing and thinking yeah. about ebb and flow thinking about how the viewer encounters the text and images throughout the book and also thinking about the sequence of the texts on their own and then thinking about how they overlap with the images and i think i mean what's uh, just referring back to something that you said earlier about these different there were almost like different three different categories of text eventually that you observed when you were in the editing process and the idea that there are different, we're, we're more used to talking about different types of photographs, but essentially that it means that it then becomes this kind of grammar or this syntax, Definitely. you know, both text and images have that equivalency and they're all part of the same coherent syntax and kind of language that mm -hmm. fulfills this sequence as a whole. So I understand I understand what you're saying about sequencing being really important. It's actually really important to the key understand it's the key to understanding the meaning mm -hmm. of 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 the of these works. So there's I mean which yeah. is is kind of I mean I think of it as something I think that's it's something that's really impressive about this book and I think it's also a hallmark of of a of a, a really good Mac book as well is mm -hmm. when you get that sort of interconnectedness and that kind of highly uh, there's no wastage either in images or in text both are really operating and sort of contributing to the overall rather than there being I mean like in books, you know, ten there's a tendency to have different types of text and essentially you're talking about sort of like, you know, pr sort of like the sort of like, this is a book text, like the index and the, mm -hmm. and the frontispiece or the introduction that rubber stamps it and all of those things. And it was really important that there weren't any of those things. And actually the distinctions are between texts are actually about emotional and kind of different invitations or entreaties to the to the reader and um i think there's uh, i wanted to there's a couple of phrases i wanted to read out from your writing which i think um for me sort of represent another category of the writing that you described which is the idea of like explicitly talking about the act of photography or the meaning of photography within this story so one of them is we did a dance together before finding this moment you trusted my intentions, welcomed me in, allowed me to look at you. I felt a freedom, a permission to simply show up and see what I might find. And there's also, we find one another somehow and learn to name ourselves, to embody our truths and own our desires. We act as mirrors, reflect each other, see ourselves anew. And I mean, I'm obviously, I'm thinking, 
there's you know there's a, a love letter that runs through the whole of the sequencing to your partner Vanessa very strongly in there but more generally than that I think that the, the, that those those two texts for me sort of epitomize why this is deeply profoundly personal work photographic work and textual yeah. work but photographic work like I I understood like you know a number of uh, you know a number of people might use the word urgency of their photographic practice mm -hmm. but i think it's it, it's something that i really am very happy that you're claiming for the work because i think that is the place in which you're coming from and it's really <laughs> deep and really personal to you so it's less about your subjects being those that you are in close proximity to, or even those that you are you most desire or most cu curious about. It's more than that. It's actually about this sort of this uh, like this urgency of of photography and memory keeping, but also the permissions that gives you to have those experiences that essentially define your personhood and your relationality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that my photographs and these in particular in this book are so much about the intersection of my own identity and yeah. the person that I'm photographing. And so I, I think you're right. There is, there's a way in which I'm always seeking a kind of connection and intimacy, but also an understanding about myself through the act of photographing. So it's so tied into my life and my emotions and who I am and my way of processing the world. So yeah, I think you're right. I think that the 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 writing and also the portraits in this book really get at that kind of need and and intense desire to process the world photographically and make sense of it that way. There's another phrase and a word that you use in the text which is being in lockstep and you say my photographing in lockstep with your breathing. Oh my attention astute. I will hold your tenderness, honor your struggle and respect your strength. And there's another phrase, I want to claim you. I want to be claimed. Mm -hmm. Amazing, I mean, I mean, incredibly generous to you to, to give those as part of the, a part of the narrative of this book. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think, the first text you read, um, the first quote you read came from a text that is me um, kind of reflecting on my own upbringing and certain things that I perhaps didn't get. There was a there was a piece of that text that was actually about my father and we ended up separating them in the book. So the text about my father now lives separately from the, the text that you just read, but it was a reflection on how through my work, I'm seeking to make space for others uh, in a way that perhaps wasn't done for me. But through that, I'm also doing it for myself. You know, subconsciously, I'm always making space for myself. I'm always, um, I'm, I'm, I'm playing out this, this pattern that I wish I had had, if that makes sense. So it's a kind of reflection on, on um, having to really make that space for myself because it wasn't necessarily given to me and then thinking about how I do that for other people in a way that is simultaneously doing it for myself. I'm I'm slightly conscious that we're talking on a Wednesday and I speak to my therapist early in the morning on Wednesday so I don't want to psychoanalyze you but <laughs> talking about your father <laughs> I mean one of the first times that I realized that what an <clears throat> incredible writer you are is your your video piece with your first person narration letter to my father which mm -hmm. is like 2017 or something is it mm -hmm. What's, yeah, yeah the date of that so yeah. I, I, um well i only i only say that in terms of like that piece that piece um was such a, a sort of explanation of of like this active will that photography and making art and communicating to an audience really meant to you like it comes from a deep place but it comes from a real place and that's so interesting that the idea that you know the way that this figure of the father appears in in this book 
is in a completely different place. I mean, it kind of confirms what you were saying in terms of, you know, being of a particular moment of how you remember things and how you mm. recount things and, and how they're part of your narrative at a certain point in life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting you bring up that video because I've been thinking recently about the connection between that and this book because, yeah. you know, they both center around uh, personal storytelling, but I've also been thinking about it in terms of the importance of text and I've always been interested in text. I, from the very beginning of my practice, I had some, some early attempts to incorporate text in photographs that didn't quite come together. Then I did incorporate it in To Survive on the Shore, but as interview text with the subjects. And yeah. then of course, in the video letter to my father, the soundtrack is a letter I've written that I read out loud. And then of course, in this book, there are these personal texts. And so I do think that video is, is an interesting link to this work because it was one of the first times that my creative writing appeared as a really significant element in the work. And I think that is most pronounced in this book. Um, so even though I've always been interested in text, I think this is a new angle and a new area pushing with yeah. having, having kind of self-reflective writing, but also writing that's purely my own. Um, and you mentioned the book doesn't have any other text and that was very intentional. You know, we don't have any curatorial text. We don't have any introductory text. I even cut the acknowledgements because I really didn't want there. Wow. I didn't want the tone to shift. You know, I just wanted yes. I wanted yeah. the viewer to be embedded in this world, to experience this poem, this moment, and then be done. I didn't want them to start thinking about me as the photographer who has people to thank. You know, I, I'm fine with them thinking about me in terms of how it affects the work, but I really didn't want that tone to shift. And so yeah. that felt really important. So the, the writing that's in here is really essential, but it was essential that it exists on its own. Yes. Now, Jess, it's, um, it's probably the cruelest question to ask, seeing as the fact that you've only just got your advanced copy of the book, <laughs> of your book. <laughs> I know, I keep, I keep looking at it. I'm like taking it yeah. in, like, is it, is it real? <laughs> it's real and by the time this recording goes out it's really real it'll be on shelves yeah. friends will be sending you pictures so all the loveliness is, is is yet to come but i wondered if you would if you would i mean i'm that's it, this whole project is about reflection so i know you've done a lot of reflecting but i think really as a thing like are you able at this point to sort of say yeah i think this is what it is this is what look at me is and i feel comfortable saying that and also just sort of reflecting a bit on um what you hope the experience is for the for the viewer of this remarkable book Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I think that this book was really and is really significant for me, both personally and also in my practice. Yeah. I, you know, I really created it in kind of a cocoon. I didn't have a lot of feedback. I wasn't posting it on social media. I was really quiet about it. And especially with the writing, that seemed really essential. I felt protective of creating space to really let myself in this moment come out. So I think that this book is very much a reflection of where I'm at in my life and my work in this moment and a certain kind of reflection. Um, you know, I definitely had a different kind of confidence making this book. I know you and I have spoken about this before, but just really following the work and where it would lead me. Yeah. So similar to that text you read about, I felt a freedom to just show up and see what I might find. I think I am, I embraced this book with a similar approach of let's see what this book becomes. And I kind of let the work lead me. So that feels like a shift from earlier work. It feels more poetic. It feels very fresh. It feels very of the moment. And it feels very responsive to the photographs and to myself at this particular time. You know, one thing that's huge for me with this work, which is perhaps very obvious and we've already talked about it, but is the inclusion of text. And yeah. I'm already thinking, you know, putting this book together has already affected how I'm thinking about other photographs and thinking about future writing. So I'm yeah. sure that that will be something that 
um, <clears throat> is present in future work. I have another project focusing on my family specifically, and I am positive that will have a written component. So I think the process yeah. of making this is going to inform how I make future work. And then yeah. something else that shifted in this work was really taking a kind of creative license over the storytelling. And, you know, some of my earlier work was more beholden to telling someone else's story. And in this work, it's full on my story. And, um, and, and not just my story, but my version of, you know, my very specific version of that story and that moment with someone else and really taking ownership of that. So yeah. those things feel really significant. It's also a sharing of my personal subjectivities in a very personal way. It does feel personal to me to yeah. put it out in the world. And I am psychoanalyzing myself and why I photograph and where that, like, you know, what kind of fracture caused this need to um, hold on to things and record things in, in the way that I experience. It's, it's, it's pretty significant and yeah. constant. So I am looking at my own psychology and thinking about that. Um, and, you know, in terms of what people, what I want people to experience from it, like I said earlier in, in this conversation, I really wanted to leave ambiguity. I wanted people to bring themselves to the work. I wanted yeah. to tell my story, but I wanted to do it in a way that left a lot of entrance points for other people. And one thing that's been really amazing and moving in uh, showing some of these newer pictures, because I have an exhibition up right now that has 20 of the pictures from this book. It's at the St. Louis Art Museum and it's been up since September. And I've had multiple people tell me that the experience of looking at the show makes them feel seen, which is yes. really powerful and, and amazing. And I'm really touched by that feedback. I think I'm so interested in this idea of the power and the intimacy of seeing and being seen. And I think that I've often thought of that in terms of a viewer looking upon a subject and, and presenting a subject in such a way that it encourages a meaningful interaction, like a real meaningful interaction. But yes. I think something has shifted in this newer work where that's working in both directions. And I've been really touched to hear that people feel, they themselves feel seen interacting with the work. So, um, so I'm interested, I'm really interested to see what happens when this lands, as you say, on shelves and in people's hands and to see how people experience it. And already some, from some very early interactions, I can tell that there's gonna be a lot of subjectivity in terms of how people read the work and, and what they bring to the work. And, and I'm really excited about that. Well, I can, I think you're absolutely right. And I can attest to that. I mean, even in our preparation for this talk, I'd be like, you know, that, that point where you take the lover to that place and you go, oh, well, that isn't actually what happened. But I like the fact that you think <laughs> that's yeah. what happened. And so I was like, there's just no way around not bringing yourself into, into this book. Uh, and that's it for me. That's it's that's the applause to you because you have created a space at a very at a time where not only do we need our thoughtfulness and how we kind of anticipate others, but um, not only and not only do you do that, but you actually create this really wonderful imaginative space for the reader to play within. So many congratulations and may the ripples of desire and projection and interaction with this incredible personal story long continue. Oh, thank you so much, Charlotte. And thank you for all the thoughtful questions. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I wish I could, I wish I could put this through the screen for you, but you'll no. see it very soon. And uh, it'll be there very soon. <laughs>